Damos paso a la doctora Siman. Es profesora y tiene, una cátedra, y tiene una cátedra de saneamiento público en el Departamento de Tecnología Ambiental. Es profesora asociada, en el tratamiento, es profesora asociada del tratamiento de anaerobio y residuos de, y aguas residuales. Y además es consultora senior en el campo de saneamiento y digestión anaerobia. Thank you very much. I could not understand what uh, was told about me, uh, <laughs> but it's clear I'm Grietje Zeeman. Um, Since October, I'm emeritus professor from Wageningen University, but I continue my work uh, with uh, LEAF, which is a spin-off company with, uh, of Wageningen University. I think that was not said. Uh, I want to speak about hydrolysis, an underestimated step in anaerobic digestion of complex wastes. Um, page down. What is page down here? <laughs> oh, I can also use this one? No. Yes. So what I want to talk about is um, shortly about hydrolysis kinetics. Um, does ammonia inhibit or not? Uh, do humic acid inhibit hydrolysis? And I want to speak about shortly about temperature. This is a picture that you have uh, often seen, and in general, what you see um, in papers is that people say hydrolysis is the right limiting step, uh, but then most of the papers uh, do focus on methanogenesis. I'm happy that Philip did uh, make an, uh, um, did do it differently this, in this presentation. Uh, at Wageningen University, um, we always focus also on hydrolysis, not only on methanogenesis. And in the last two decades, there were full, f four theses, PhD theses, that were fully uh, addressing uh, anaerobic hydrolysis. And the last one was published in 2016. And I will try to give a short summary of uh, this uh, yeah, 16 years' work in, in total. Hydrolysis uh, kinetics, shortly. Um, when you want to determine uh, uh, hydrolysis constant, you also have to determine biochemical methane potential, as hydrolysis is always related to the biodegradable fraction. And the BMP is the maximum amount of methane from anaerobic conversion of substrate at time is endless, at least, at least when you uh, use the, the normally uh, applied 30 days or even longer days uh, BMP test. Um, and I want not to uh, go in detail here, but I want to show you this paper, which was recently uh, published by a group of international scientists in order to standardize this biomethane uh, potential test. And I think it's for everyone good to, uh, when you want to do a BMT test, to read this paper. Uh, in general, hydrolysis is described by first order hydrolysis kinetics, meaning dp dt is minus kh times p, and p is then the concentration by the credible polymer, and kh is the first order hydrolysis constant. And you can also uh, derive the formula for batch test, as you can see here in this, uh, in this slide, and of course also for CSTRs. Wendy Saunders uh, did take an, another approach in her PhD thesis. Um, she developed a model for surface-related hydrolysis kinetics. And what you can see here is that the decrease of the average particle radius with time can be written by RT, which is the average particle radius at, at time t, uh, equal to RO, which is the average radius at time zero, uh, minus the surface-related hydrolysis constant time the uh, time, times the time uh, divided by the density of the particle substrate. And what she did is she did uh, do a batch test with, in this case, uh, she took starch with small particles, um, starch particles, with large starch particles, and with medium starch particles. And she calculated uh, uh, with the use of image analysis the surface-based uh, 
hydrolysis constant and showed that for the different particle sizes, the surface-based um, uh, hydrolysis constant was equal about 0.4 grams per square meter per hour. And when you apply uh, first order kinetics, you can see that with the small particles, you have the highest hydro, uh, first order hydrolysis constant of 2.1, and with the large particles, you have the lowest um, uh, first order hydrolysis constant, showing that um, hydrolysis is surface related. Actually, she decided that the surface based uh, model is uh, yeah, a mechanistic model, which would be more attractive, but for practice, uh, it's not so useful because it's very difficult to determine the, the particle, the, the surface of the particles in practice because they have really uh, very uh, different particles. And with starch, yeah, you can use um, image analysis because they are more or less circular uh, particles, but in practice, you will never find it part with starch. So maybe the approach that Philippe Steyer uh, just presented um, extracting different fraction could be an improvement for the hydrolysis rate constant determination. So surface-based hydrolysis constant is independent of the particle size of the substrate, whereas the first order hydrolysis constant is decreasing with an increasing particle size. And that's always in practice also used because I've seen different presentations where people are grinding the substrate. And in that way, you are changing your hydrolysis rate constant. And that's something to take into account when you determine uh, in a lab scale, uh, yeah, after grinding the hydrolysis rate constant, and you do not do the same grinding in practice, yeah, you will not uh, design a proper reactor. A substrate that contains a lot of particles is uh, animal manure. And this is a picture of my own PhD thesis some time ago. Um, and next to uh, particles, animal manure also contains a lot of ammonia. So the question is, ammonia is inhibiting methanogenesis, but is it also inhibiting hydrolysis? So these are um, data from my own thesis in a modern version, because at that time we didn't have computerized uh, pictures. Um, you see the hydrolysis percentage on the y-axis and the ammonia concentration on the x-axis, and the darker the dots, the more ammonia. And you can see that there is a clear relation between the percentage of hydrolysis and the concentration of ammonia. At least that's what is seemingly the case. In my discussion at that time, I wrote the following. Or not ammonia, but organic compounds available in urine or manure inhibit hydrolysis. Because yeah, the ammonia concentration in manure is determined by dilution. And manure also contains a large fraction of inert organics, for example, humic and fulvic acids. And when you take the same data, but instead of uh, the ammonia concentration, take the related inert dissolved COD concentration, you find a similar relationship. So, from that onwards, we were focusing also on humic and fulvic acids and hydrolysis. And Tanya Fernandez, she did uh, determine with model substrates uh, the relation between ammonia and hydrolysis percentage. And this is for uh, a lipid, tributyrin as a, as a model substrate, but she also did the same for cellulose. And she showed that uh, increase of ammonia did not decrease the hydrolysis rate. So from that onward, yeah, we focus more on humic acids as the potential inhibitor of uh, hydrolysis. So inhibition of humic acids. What are humic acids and fulvic acids? These are the end products of the biological decay of biota residues, hardly degradable organic acids, behave like weak polyelectrolytes, Humic acids have a higher molecular weight than fulvic acids. Humic acids are soluble at pH larger than 3.5, and 
and fulvic acids are soluble at all pHs. And humic acids can look like this, but they can also be somewhat more different. And there are different nice pictures of all kinds of humic acids. So Tanya Fernandez started to uh, extract humic acid and fulvic acids from manure and maize, an uh, extensive uh, extraction procedure. And with this humic acid, she started to do batch experiments to show whether they are inhibiting hydrolysis or not. She started with cellulose and cellulase, so not with uh, uh, biomass, and showed that in the range of 0.5 to 5 grams humic and fulvic acid extracted from maize and manure, you have a very strong inhibition of hydrolysis. From that onwards, she started with biomass, and she used a pure culture, Fibrobacter succinogenes. And you can see when you um, do take the results without the lag phase that you have a strong decrease in the hydrolysis rate constant uh, from 0.7 to 0.04 when you increase the humic acid concentration from 0 to 5 grams per liter. So a strong proof that, uh, that uh, humic and fulvic acid, because similar results were also shown for fulvic acid, both for the manure and from the mice humic acids, um, that they are really inhibiting the hydrolysis. And the last PhD uh, result, results from Samet Asman, um, he used not a pure culture, but he used uh, full anaerobic biomass, in this case, uh, cranial sludge from airbag, and he did do batch tests with cellulose at 30 degrees Celsius and uh, a pH of 7. And he, here you see the control, uh, where you see the green line, the most above is uh, hydrolysis, followed by acidogenesis, followed by methanogenesis. And when you add um, 5 gram per liter humic acid, you can clearly see that uh, hydrolysis inhibited, but also acidogenesis inhibited, because you see a large fraction between hydrolysis and uh, acidogenesis. What he also did is he added calcium, uh, so humic acids and calcium, and then you see that there's a recovery of uh, the hydrolysis. So apparently the calcium can mitigate the uh, inhibition effect of the hydrolysis. So what is the possible uh, reason behind this? So the hypothesis is that the humic acid do contain functional groups, and this functional group can absorb the hydrolytic enzymes which are excreted by the uh, biomass, and therefore the cellulose cannot be degraded. And when you add calcium or maybe other uh, uh, cationic uh, compounds, um, then the humic acid will absorb the calcium and the enzymes are, again, free for hydrolysis. So that was the theory. So then Samet Asman uh, thought, I have only done batch experiments, so it's better to also show um, this, verify this also with continuous experiments. So he did do uh, continuous reactor operation CSTRs with a HRT of 20 days, 30 degrees and pH 7, organic loading rate of 1 point gram Vs per liter per day. He used cellulose and xylan as substrates and a mixture of enzymes in some of the reactors as an addition. And also uh, in some of the reactors he added calcium. So he had the control reactor one, he had a reactor uh, where humic acid were uh, added, reactor two, humic acid and calcium in reactor three, humic acid and enzymes in reactor four, and humic acid and calcium in enzymes in reactor 5. And then there was a, a bit of surprise in the results. So what you see here is the hydrolysis efficiency in time, um, 220 days uh, performance. Um, you see different periods where the humic acid concentration was increased. So he increased the humic acid concentration from 0 to 8 grams per liter. Um, I should help you a bit because it is a compl complicated figure, I think. So the first three lines, you see the control, the humic acids with enzymes and calcium, and the humic acid and, and enzymes. And they perform more or less the same. So 
uh, no inhibition seems to occur in those three reactors. While when you have only humic acid, that was what we expected, you see inhibition, so especially at the higher humic acid concentrations. But you also see here that when you add calcium, we find the same inhibition as with only humic acid. So what we had shown in the batch experiment, we could not verify in the continuous experiments. And apparently when you add enzymes, they fulfill the role of uh, adsorbing to the, to the humic acids and then the um, enzymes which are uh, excreted by the biomass can do their, the work. Uh, and also enzymes and calcium do the same work. And apparently our theory is that when you add calcium, that you get con uh, con conglomerates of uh, particles and therefore the surface area is becoming smaller. And that might be the reason that you find inhibition. But yeah, that is only an hypothesis in this case. But yeah, with this I also want to say when you do batch experiments, it's always good to verify also with continuous experiments. Um, Summit also did some mi microbial population analysis and he showed that ferment fermentative hydraulic bacteria and hydri hydrogenotrophic methanogens were affected by the presence of humic acids, or also some of the uh, methanogens, and the acetoclastic methanogens were not affected. Then I want to shortly uh, show you a bit about temperature. Um, was already mentioned that low temperatures can um, yeah, make your life uh, miserable, especially when you have a wastewater with a very low concentration and you cannot increase the temperature in an efficient way. Now, example domestic sewage. Um, you need to treat at the prevailing temperature. Um, that means that you will have a very low hydrolysis rate and that you need long sludge retention times. So uh, that means that you have to build a large reactor and that is in general not economical feasible. Now we have thought of two solutions for this, a USB digester, and I will show you some results of that. And the other one is yeah, actually the other field of my research, search source separation. I can talk hours about that, but I will only show you two slides. So first, the USB digester is a USB connected to a digester. Uh, you operate the system at a short HRT at a low temperature, the USB. And what you do is you transfer the non-stabilized solids to the digester in order to be stabilized in the digester and you bring back the biomass which is grown in the digester to the USB and that should be sufficient to convert at a low temperature the dissolved COD. So what you expect is some biogas in the USB and the largest fraction of biogas in the, in the digester. I will now summarize in one slide, uh, I think, three years uh, experimental work um, of Lai uh, Sang, a PhD student in our uh, university. Um, what you see is when you operate the USB digester with a USB at 10 to 20 degrees Celsius, you find similar performance as USBs at trop tropical conditions. So that is what we hoped and what we could achieve. We had a higher biogas produc production in the digester as compared to the USB. It's also what we predicted. But we si did see more hydrosis in the USB at low temperature than we expected based on normal, normal Arrhenius uh, equations. So we would expect at 10 degrees especially very low hydrosis in the USB. And Lai Zhang did do some uh, additional batch experiment to show why we were uh, having this increased hydrolysis at low temperature. So what he did do is he did uh, batch experiments, uh, one control at 35 degrees Celsius, that is the, the most on the left, uh, and then the other ones he took um, a very short period of 35 degrees Celsius, he cooled down with ice within a couple of minutes, and um, then he continued the batch digestion at a lower temperature. And you see three cases, one at 25 degrees Celsius, one at 15 and one at 10 degrees Celsius. And uh, you always see one control where temperature was kept at 10, 
15 or 25 degrees Celsius. And what you, what you can see here is that when you compare the one which was continuous at the low temperature, and especially when you go to 15 and 10 degrees Celsius, so that is very clear. You have a much lower hydrolysis as compared to the one where you have a short um, increase in temperature in the beginning at 30 to 35 degrees Celsius. And the theory that we developed is that at 35 degrees Celsius in the short period, you, the biomass is excreting a lot of uh, enzymes, and those enzymes can still continue working at low temperature. While when you uh, have low temperatures over the whole period, then uh, you excrete only a low amount of, uh, of uh, enzymes, and you will have a much lower hydrolysis rate as compared to the first case. And if you have, uh, have seen, you can also see that the biodegradability, so the total amount of uh, uh, substrate that is converted at a lower temperature is considerably de decreasing. Now, that is actually for the USB uh, digester system is not positive because we produce more dissolved COD and VFA in the USB, which should be converted um, to methane. So you need more methanogenic biomass to be grown in the digester. And what we have seen is, especially at 10 degrees Celsius, that can be a limiting step. Uh, a way to uh, deal with that is, uh, and that's also published by Lai Sang, is to have co-digestion in your uh, digester in order to increase the amount of methanogenic bacteria that you bring to your USB. Now then finally, I like to say something about uh, new sanitation because yeah, we are dealing with a lot of wastewater with a very low concentration and then we have to find this, uh, yeah, uh, different options like uh, USB membrane or uh, a USB digester, so it becomes a, a rather complicated. It is also possible to uh, not dilute our precious toilet wastewater, uh, collect it with other type of toilets, like vacuum toilets, where you use a very low amount of water, and keep the grey water separate. Now, we have developed that concept uh, in the Netherlands, and uh, I will not explain that in detail. We apply a USB anaerobic treatment for the black water, which is very concentrated, um, and then apply nutrient recovery afterwards, and gray water is separately treated. And I want to show you here that this has now been applied at full scale in uh, an office building in uh, the south of the Netherlands, uh, the Dutch Institute for Le Ecological Research in Wageningen, uh, where they uh, have connected to that an algae uh, recovery, nutrients recovery with algae. Um, the system is applied in, um, in the city in the north of the Netherlands, Snake, for 250 houses. In a small scale, it's applied in my own house. And uh, it is recently applied in the building of the Ministry of uh, Infrastructure and Environment. And you can see here the anaerobic digester being installed there. So, yeah, we cannot change the world in once, but I think there are uh, lots of opportunity to also apply these new concepts. And um, recently there was an EU proposal uh, uh, approved. Frank Rokala from Aqualia as project leader, and Juan Lema is also uh, in that project. So, um, in that project, four new de uh, demonstrations in Sweden, the Netherlands, Spain, and Belgium will be, uh, will be uh, shown. So I think we will go a step forward also with this technology. And with that, I want to go to my conclusions. Anaerobic hydrolysis is limited by particle surface. Ammonia is not inhibiting anaerobic hydrolysis. Humic and fulvic acid do inhibit anaerobic hydrolysis. Um, could be mitigated, for example, by addition of uh, enzymes. Um, Short-term temperature increase results in higher hydrolysis rate at low temperature. It could be profitable maybe in cases where you have ambient uh, temperature uh, anaerobic digestion and during the night temperature is uh, decreasing, then you could profit of the enzymes produced during daytime. And finally, source separation allows for anaerobic treatment of black water and is applied at four locations in the Netherlands. Thank you very much for your attention.